to the weekly rushes, your rush rush through all the weekly movie and streaming news, both on screen, off screen, around screen, uh, outside the screen, inside the screen, and I'm about to drink Starbucks double shot espresso, chilled, mm, don't you know? And so as ever, we start with some of the news that's been happening off screen and off camera. Um, the big sort of um, traumatic story, if you like, over the last couple of weeks, or last week certainly, has been the Anne Hesch story. Anne Hesch, the actress from um, Donnie Brasco, Six Days, Seven Nights. She was also formerly the partner of Ellen DeGeneres. Um, this is the story of her, f her essentially driving her car um, into a house in LA. Um, she uh, essentially, she was caught up in a sort of road incident uh, en route to uh, this junction. Uh, she carried on driving, went through the uh, garden and into a house, causing the house to catch fire. There were 60 firefighters were engaged to try and put the fire out. The woman who lived in the house, known the house, was lucky to escape with her life. But Anne Hesch uh, was uh, severely injured. I mean, in fact, she, uh, she was so severely sort of damaged and sort of, I'm not too sure whether it was that she was so burnt that they couldn't ID her or that they couldn't find her ID, but there was a struggle to identify uh, that it was actually Anne, Anne Hesch. Um, she was described as being in a stable and controlled sort of state um, initially by representatives, but then despite previous reports suggesting that she was stable shortly afterwards, um, it was said or released that she's become unconscious, she'd slipped into a coma, and she's essentially in a critical condition, and she's still in that condition. She has, uh, to quote a representative of hers, she has a significant pulmonary injury requiring mechanical ventilation and burns that require surgical intervention. As I say, authorities are also investigating the fact that there was a driving misdemeanor that, uh, or a hit, a hit and run incident, if you like, uh, prior to her actually impacting the house. Um, it, now, of course, there is so much speculation about what this could be. I mean, there are some reports that uh, claim to have seen a bottle of vodka near the uh, gear stick or in the front of the car prior to her having any of the uh, incidents that she was involved in. Um, and of course, there's sort of split sort of loyalties here. There's lots of people whose sort of tributes and hearts have been sort of shared and uh, with, with Anne Hesch sort of, you know, wishing her get well and, uh, you know, opining the fact that she must have been in such a terrible place for this to happen, a terrible state. Was she in a, uh, was she in a row? Was she drunk? What, whatever she was in, whatever was happening, um, there's clearly some kind of mental breakdown at the heart of this. And so, of course, there's a huge amount of sympathy, empathy and concern for Anne Hesch. But of course, within all of this, there's also the woman who lived in the house, a woman called Miss Michelle, uh, for whom, you know, we have to have some, we have to pause and have some compassion and thoughts for her. In fact, a representative of the woman who lives at the house said Miss Michelle is devastated by what happened to her on Friday, not only because she and her pets almost lost their lives, but because all of her property, including items of profound sentimental value, were destroyed. She asks for privacy at this incredibly difficult time. I know that there was a fund started online to raise money for the owner of the house, but of course, you know, this is another one of those sort of Hollywood stories where, you know, unless she comes out of her coma, are we going to get to the bottom of what was actually happening here? Was there an argument? Was there a row? Um, you know, was was this the consequence of a, of, a, of a mental breakdown of some form? Was it a hit and run? You know, we, we, you know, while she's unconscious and while she's in a critical condition, uh, I don't think we're going to be any the wiser. But that's quite a dramatic Hollywood story, uh, which is still alive at the moment. Obviously, over the period of time that we've uh, not been doing weekly rushes, been away in Crete, uh, Will Smith, we talked about this on the uh, Popcorn Junkies Instagram account, Will Smith broke his silence and shared the fact that he was deeply remorseful for the loudest slap in Hollywood history, or a slap that was heard around the world, to quote Will Smith himself. Uh, in a film that was nearly six minutes long on YouTube, Will Smith um, essentially talked about how he was fogged out by that point. It was all fuzzy. Like, and that he's reached out to Chris Rock, and the message that came back is that he's not ready to talk. Um, he kind of, you know, he says he wants to apologise to Chris's family. There's obviously a connection between him and Chris Rock's parents, so he, he reached out to them too. Uh, Tony Rock was my man, said Will Smith, this is probably irreparable. I spent the last three months replaying and understanding the nuance and complexity of what happened. I'm not going to try to unpack all of that right now, but I can say to all of you, there's no part of me that thinks that was the right way to behave in the moment. He talked about, you know, the much sort of chatted and gossiped about concept that was he sort of encouraged to slap Chris Rock uh, indirectly uh, by Jada Pinkett Smith, his wife. Uh, he says, no, I made a choice on my own for my own experience and my history with Chris. Jada had nothing to do with it. He then apologises to her and says, sorry to his children uh, and his family for the heat that he brought on all of us. And he also goes to great lengths to apologise to the other nominees and the other Oscar winners on the day. Is this enough? I mean, I worry that this apology or a further apology from Will Smith is, is more about perhaps trying to, um, you know, release 
or, or, or make good the incoming uh, project called Emancipation that he's doing with Apple TV in which he plays a slave uh, who escapes slavery um, and the photographs of his treatment kind of played a huge part in the uh, in the making illegal or the, you know the outlawing of slavery in, in in America, it's a big project for Apple TV, and it's a project that a lot of people were talking about uh, Will Smith in terms of him potentially being the first actor to win back to back Oscars. Um, so, you know, could this be just you know it's hard, isn't it, to balance its business? He's got to do it for business, but he's also got to do it for on a sort of personal and, and sort of moral basis too. Uh, and in weighing those two, quantifying where the weight lies in that is always a difficult difficult thing to measure. Big story whilst we were away was uh, Warner Brothers slash HBO Max slash Discovery's decision to axe Batgirl. Now, Batgirl was always a DC film that was going to go straight to HBO Max. You know, that's uh, Warner Brothers streaming wing, if you like. Um, but uh, Warner Brothers, uh, in, in, uh, are essentially, they're, scra they're going to slowly scrap HBO Max. They're going to fold it into a Discovery, an already existing Discovery uh, streaming channel. Um, they're trying to make huge cost savings. They're trying to save about $3 billion worth of, of, of money. Um, and so what they've done, which is unheard of, they've scrapped the entire Batgirl film. They, they were at post-production and they just axed it at a cost of between 70 to 100 million dollars. Um, what makes the whole decision really quite brutal, and it just shows you how harsh Hollywood can be, the two directors, Adil El Arbi and Bilal Falah, I believe they're Moroccan, um, they were also the uh, showrunners for uh, Miss Marvel, which again was, you know, was fired out of uh, Disney's kind of shotgun, if you like, with great excitement and hasn't really done too well on Disney Plus. So they were the darlings at Marvel. Miss Marvel didn't do too well. Will they still be the darlings there? They were kind of the darlings, if you like, for Batgirl. Batgirl's been axed and axed without any viewing. It's not like anyone's gonna be able to see it anywhere. You're not, you're not gonna be able to see it, see it anywhere. And so are they the darlings at DC? Some have suggested that the preview screenings were disastrous or atrocious, whereas others are sort of saying that although, yeah, the test screenings might not have been great, it was more to do with the fact that there's regime change at Warner and there's cost savings that need to be enacted. What makes it deeply, deeply sad, though, for the directors is that they were actually at El Arby, one of the director's weddings, his wedding, when they learned of Batgirl's bad news. Um, so imagine that, imagine on your wedding day, ste stepping up to the altar and getting a text on your phone saying, sorry mate, but your movie's been pulled. So it just shows you that fragile, fragile, the fragile threads of success in Hollywood. One minute you can be everything to all people and the next minute you can completely lose it. A little bit like the director of End of Watch who went on to direct the first Suicide Squad film and has kind of struggled since then to kind of recuperate or recover from the faulty step of uh, Suicide Squad, the first version. In other news, Kevin Spacey uh, has been ordered to pay $31 million to the producers of House of Cards um, due to him being fired, due to the sexual misconduct allegations. This went to a sort of arbitration sort of court, if you like, and in, arbitra in arbitration, the arbitrator found that Kevin Spacey's conduct did constitute a material breach of his acting and executive producing agreements. So whilst there aren't any criminal prosecutions here, it's felt almost in a sort of work tribunal sort of situation that his he he broke the rules and he was uh, sort of inappropriate in 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 sufficient in a sufficient manner that doesn't necessarily require criminal prosecution but in a sufficient manner for them to have had to have cancelled house of cards at a huge cost 30 more million and so kevin spacey is now liable for that amount i mean whether he's going to be able to pay that god only knows obviously the big 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 sad news tragic news this week is the death of dame olivia newton john obviously she played sandy in greece uh, in her career she sold a hundred she made a hundred she sold a hundred Hundred million albums, come on! Uh, what an astonishing number of albums. Uh, and she starred, albeit it was probably her main role, and it's her most famous role in Greece, the 1978 musical film. Uh, it, it is one of the most successful f uh, musical films in history. Uh, she was once described by the Rolling Stone as a sweet, innocent 70s version of Doris Day. Um, she obviously starred alongside John Travolta. She had two number ones with Summer Nights and You're the One That I Want. You're not going to be able to get them out of your head now, are you? Um, and physical, let's get physical. Do you remember that? Oh my God, such a classic. Spent 10 weeks at the top of the US charts. Little known fact, Olivia Newton-John wanted to be a vet, but doubted her ability to pass the science exams. And instead, she turned to her other interests, which was performing. She took a bargain basement fee of just £125,000 to star alongside John Travolta in Greece. And of course, most notably in her personal life, in 2005, she tragically, or we assume she tragically lost her husband, Patrick McDermott, uh, who went missing on a boat, uh, presumed drowned, but that was never really resolved. 
uh, tributes that came in. Stockard Channing, who played Rizzo in Greece, said, I don't know if I've known a lovelier human being. Olivia was the essence of summer. Her sunniness, her warmth and her grace are what always comes to mind when I think of her. Hugh Jackman said of uh, Olivia Newton-John that she was his first crush and described her as one of the most open, generous and funny people I've ever known. Director James Gunn interestingly had a connection with her too, saying, really sad to hear about the passing of, of Olivia Newton-John. She was my first real crush as a kid. I loved Greece, and I coincidentally also bought and lived in for a while the wonderful home she built in Malibu. Curious connection there to uh, Marvel. A contentious casting choice here. Contentious because of his own behaviour. James Franco, obviously, was caught up in the... Uh, I think he had he settled out of court with a number of uh, female students of his acting school where allegedly he would uh, uh, sort of encourage sex scenes and, and, and classes with nudity and what have you. And so, of course, you know, contentious that he's taking on any role. But anyway, he's been cast as... And I can see why. I can see why. Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, uh, he's been cast as Fidel Castro, which has got the support of Fidel Castro's daughter, who says that he is a perfect fit to play her Cuban leader, Cuban revolutionary father, um, in a new film called Alina of Cuba. Alina of Cuba obviously is about Fidel Castro's daughter, Alina, and so Alina Fernandez, who the film is about, has said, yes, yes, no, this is good, James Franco. She, in fact, she quoted as saying, James Franco has an obvious physical resemblance with Fidel, besides his skills and charisma. Um, it's being directed by Miguel Bardem, and it's scripted by the same person who wrote The Motorcycle Diaries. But not everyone is happy. Not everyone is happy about James Franco being cast as Fidel Castro. No, no, no. John Leguizamo, I hope I pronounced that correctly, John Leguizamo. Um, he has been in Carlito's Way. He was in Super Mario Brothers, Romeo and Juliet, famously. And he was also a brilliantly sort of creepy character in the Netflix series Bloodlines. Uh, John Leguizamo has gone on Instagram saying, you know, this is just no good. He says that historically the era he grew up in the area the era where they told you to change your name stay out of the sun that only white latinos or white passing latinos would get jobs and they weren't even the main leads his beef is that for too many years uh, white actors have taken on uh, Latin American roles that should have been cast, should have, in which they should have used Latin American actors, and I think he has, I think he has a fair point. I think, I think he's kind of right. I think he, he's kind of revised his opinion, he sort of rolled back a bit from that. I think he came out, he came out of the traps a little bit hostile and a little bit angry. I think James Franco does have some, have some Latino heritage in him somewhere, um, but he clarified this. Uh, John Leguizamo Carol clarified by saying, "All right, look, I've got no problems with James Franco. Okay, I grew up in an era where Latin people couldn't play Latin people on film." And that's his point, and that's a fair enough point, I think. But obviously, in this project, uh, Fidel Castro's daughter says, "See, si. I think you have to say, see, si. it's it's game on." Patricia Arquette, Patricia Arquette, cracking actress, crazy actress, bizarre, balmy, odd, and strange. She's currently to be seen in Severance. Uh, she plays the, one of the bosses in, in Severance. She's, she's brilliant. Um, she's making her directorial debut with a film called Gonzo Girl, which is starring Camilla Moroni. Uh, and Willem Dafoe, as well as Patricia Arquette herself, is based on the book by Cheryl Della Pietra. Uh, and it's a great concept. The reason I wanted to flag this up is listen to the blurb. The blurb on this sounds fantastic. It's set in 1992 and it follows an aspiring writer played by Moroni, Camilla Moroni. Um, she has an exciting new job uh, as the assistant to a legendary gonzo journalist played by Willem Dafoe, uh, living in his compound, his party house in Aspen. And she's under orders to help to write his last work or a, or a work. But a basic Basically, he's, he's a sodden sort of drunkard who can't hold a thought together. He rants and raves and he can't, you know, nothing he says is publishable. So this becomes a story about the way in which Moroni's character uh, actually manages to um, sort of write the story for him. In a sense, it's about an assistant, a ghostwriter for a crackpot kind of character. Patricia Rocket is uh, directing and she's uh, yet to know what sort of role she's got in the project. Anyone here a Godzilla fan? I don't understand the Godzilla thing. I'm just not, I don't... For me, Godzilla is just a great big lumbering turd with arms that kind of goes and fires fire. I mean, I know he's, he has a huge cult, cultural following and all that. He's never done it for me. He's just a lumbering mass. And I don't understand what he's a metaphor for, if he's a metaphor for anything. Anyway, there's a new Apple TV series coming to Apple TV called Godzilla and the Titans, working title star. But Kurt Russell is coming back to it. It's the first time he's been in a TV project since Hawaii 5 back in 1977. Uh, so he's coming to Godzilla and the Titans. And this sits 
this sits within the franchise. By all accounts, this will explore and follow one family's journey to uncover the buried secrets and legacy linking them to the secret organization known as the Monarch. Um, this slots in alongside 2014's Godzilla film, 2017's uh, Kong Skull Island, 2019's Godzilla King of the Monsters, and 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. So this is canon, this is this this ties in, it even, it even connects with the anime series called Skull Island. Um, starring alongside Kurt Russell is also Wyatt Russell, his son, who has recently been seen in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and more recently in Under the Banner of Heaven. We all need a bit of Peter Dinklage. I've missed Peter Dinklage since Game of Thrones has gone away. Where's he been? Apart from in the, um, uh, what's the, uh, Serrano de Bergerac, Serrano, I just couldn't, I literally couldn't get myself to go through the doors of the cinema to see that. I just, it's a musical, sorry, just no. Anyway, Peter Dinklage is, uh, has been cast, it's been announced that he's been cast in the Hunger Games prequel. Feels like that could be a good franchise uh, for him to settle into after Game of Thrones. Obviously, he's best known for his major role in TV's Game of Thrones. Uh, he's soon to be seen in the Troma cult classic, uh, The Toxic Avenger, which was a sort of really cult B-movie kind of exploitation kind of horror flick musical, uh, which they've done stage versions of, a bit Rocky Horror Picture Show and all that kind of stuff. So he's soon to be seen in that, but he's starring in the Hunger Games uh, prequel, uh, which is called The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. David Harbour, we love him, Stranger Things. <sighs> Also brilliant in Black Widow, check him out there. Uh, and Pedro Pascal, come on, the man who plays the Mandalorian, though more recently was just the most brilliant but half of a buddy movie in the unbearable weight of massive talent alongside Nick Cage. I mean, he really is, in a sense, the, the as much as Nick, Nick Cage is, he's a guilty pleasure in that film. Well, David Harbour and Pedro Pascal are coming together in a project called My Dentist's Murder Trial. This intrigued me when I saw this. It's a limited series for HBO. It's inspired by an article by James Lasden uh, in the New Yorker called My Dentist's Murder Trial, Adultery, False Identities and a Lethal Sedation. And really, this is the true crime chronicling of the story of Dr. Gilberto Nunez, who in 2015 was indicted for killing his friend uh, by getting him to ingest a substance that caused his death. They're also parts of the story around infidelity and fraud and what have you. Um, but this, I think this sounds really exciting. Whilst Pedro Pascal is playing Dr. Nunez himself, the killer dentist. I mean, it's a bit kind of, uh, it's a little bit um, Little Shop of Horrors, isn't it? The killer dentist. I love this idea. Anyway, it's called My Dentist's Murder Trial. It's as yet unclear as to whether um, David Harbour will play the victim, though I, I think it's a pretty safe bet he's going to play the other main character in it. Jason Momoa was recently uh, on the uh, Warner Brothers studio lot, moving from one studio lot to another studio lot, intercepted the uh, Warner Brothers studio tour. They saw him going into a um, into a sort of uh, Winnie Bago that had Ben Affleck's name on it and boom, before you know it, it's out, the cat's out, the bat's out of the bag, the cat's out of the bag, the cat's out of the box, the bat's in the box. Uh, it's all over the press that Ben Affleck is donning the bat cape, the bat suit, and he's yet again appearing as Batman in Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, the sequel, which I was amazed by. I was thinking, God, that must have been shot. I thought that was shot and in the can, the whole Amber Heard thing and all that kind of stuff. But no, Jason Momoa has revealed that Ben Affleck is uh, making a return as the caped crusader in this situation. How do you feel about there being many different Batmans? Obviously, one of the things that's gone with Batgirl being axed is Michael Keaton's return as Batman. Can we cope with all these different Batmen? Like, can we cope also with the new Joker that's come from the Batman? alongside, you know, Heath Ledger's Joker and alongside Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. Can we, can, we, can we deal with all these kind of many iterations of the same character? It's not that complicated, is it? You don't get a much more staggering cast than this. This is quite something. This is some talent. This is some talent in this. So uh, the director of that great movie, Mud, though I have to say it was a great movie starring Matthew McConaughey, though there were great sections in it that when we watched it, we used to have to pause, rewind, replay to try and make sense of what Matthew McConaughey was saying. Sometimes it was so hard, his accent was so strong. Anyway, the director of Mud, Jeff Nichols, his next project is called The Bike Riders. Um, I think we posted about this on the Instagram account. Uh, but this project stars, get this, Jodie Comer, uh, Austin Butler, Elvis and Tom Hardy. Oh my God, it's a, it's a film that's inspired by a picture book or a book by the photography of Danny Lyon, who wrote, who did a book in 1967, also called The Bike Riders. Uh, and this film is essentially gonna be set in the 1960s and it's gonna follow a sort of fictional Midwestern motorcycle club. 
inspired, as I say, by the photographs of Danny Lyon. Um, this sounds like a fascinating project. There's not much more to it than that at the moment. I'm sure the accents will be strong. Uh, but, you know, Jodie Comer's obviously coming off the back of Killing Eve, and obviously Austin Butler's coming off the back of the success of Elvis. He's absolutely sensational. I mean, he makes that film. He's got to be in with a shout for the Oscar. And Tom Hardy, obviously, is coming off the back of the mediocre, if I'm honest, uh, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. He's, he's working on a third instalment. But yeah, what a cast. I mean, Jodie Comer, Austin Butler, and Tom Hardy. Jeff Nichols, he, he's, got, he's got star pulling magnetism, hasn't he? I mean, his, his ability to kind of corral so many good names under one roof is quite something. Lady Gaga. Oh, Lady Gaga. She confirmed, uh, we'll play it now. She confirmed with uh, this film that she uh, posted, and in fact, Todd Phillips, the director of Joker, uh, uh, and the Joker sequel, also posted it on his social medias, uh, confirming that essentially it's the confirmation that Lady Gaga will be appearing in Joker 2, or Joker Folly Adieu. Um, which uh, is going to essentially they've sort of released the date it's going to be released on the 4th of October 2024 which will have meant there's been a five year gap and I'm a big believer that five year gaps or long gaps between films that are essentially in the same realm or the same franchise is a good thing I think that's going to mean that uh, you know the appetite and the desire and the hunger for the follow up is going to be a, a sort of fever pitch and breaking point um, that we're, we're going to be tearing each other's faces off uh, a little bit like uh, the Joker can do to, to watch this we assume she's going to be in this film as Harley Quinn, though it's not going to be the conventional Harley Quinn sort of bouncing around as, as uh, Joker's uh, girlfriend. Uh, Zazie Beetz has also been in, uh, confirmed as being in talks to return to Folle Adieu. Uh, the title Folle Adieu is a French term for a, an identical mental disorder that affects two different people. So it could be, if you look at this sort of dancing, twirling kind of animation of what looks like uh, Harley Quinn, Lady Gaga and Joaquin Phoenix, uh, you know, are they going to be mirror images of each other are they is she being that she's one half of trying to help him she because harley quinn originally is the psychotherapist or psychiatrist in the um in the asylum that joker is kept in so perhaps we're going to see a sort of that's the mirror image maybe we're going to get a mirror image of awfulness in the two of them and it's going to become a sort of film about the dark turgid strange degeneration of a codependent relationship god almighty it sounds fantastic doesn't it any Patrick Swayze fans out here? I have to confess, I've obviously got a soft spot for Patrick Swayze. Obviously, Dirty Dancing did, the, did its thing. Ghost, that was Patrick Swayze. Uh, Roadhouse, uh, Patrick Swayze film. A film that completely passed me by. I, I have to confess, the 1989 film Roadhouse, in which he played a bouncer in a Missouri bar, completely passed me by. But anyway, uh, needless to say, uh, it's getting a remake, as most things from the 80s do. Uh, it's being remade by Jake Gyllenhaal, starring, and Doug Lyman, directing. Whereas the original was set in a bar called The Double Deuce. And as I say, uh, it's a sort of sleazy bar in small town, Missouri. This new iteration of Roadhouse will see Jake Gyllenhaal as a former UFC fighter who takes a job as a bouncer at a rough and tumble roadhouse in the Florida Keys. Um, so this is going to be a new spin, a new take. I think Jake Gyllenhaal has great. Jake Gyllenhaal often brings a sort of a kind of weight and gravitas to, to often potentially quite disposable projects. He sort of lifts them up a bit and makes them interesting. So I think this is one that's worth keeping an eye on. It hasn't got a working title at the moment other than it's a Roadhouse remake. Cary Grant. Any Cary Grant fans here? I love Cary Grant. I love Cary Grant in uh, all of his Hitchcock films. He was brilliant. Um, he was obviously born Archibald Alexander Leach. Um, ITV are making a film project or a drama about Cary Grant uh, called Archie, obviously, named after Cary Grant's birth name, Archibald. Uh, this is going to star Jason Isaacs as uh, Cary Grant. Uh, and it will start with profiling the Hollywood star's uh, birth in Bristol in 1904 and it'll tell the story of him coming through poverty. It's not an entirely dissimilar story to the story of Charlie Chaplin in many ways. Uh, it, it'll look at his father's uh, adultery, it'll look at the loss of his brother, how he joined a music hall act and how he rose into becoming the Cary Grant that starred in countless Hitchcock films such as To Catch a Thief, Notorious, Suspicion, uh, North by Northwest as well. Brilliant, brilliant actor. He's quite wooden, but there was, that was part of his charm. Two of my favourite sort of Hollywood actors were Cary Grant and James Stewart. And so that's a new drama coming to ITV, commissioned by ITV and Britbox called Archie. And this final story, I thought this was quite amusing. Uh, Peter Jackson, uh, obviously the director of Lord of the Rings, all the original Lord of the Rings films and the Hobbit films and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we've got the new Amazon series is about to land any minute now, the Rings of Power uh, and all of that. And apparently Amazon said that they were going to keep in touch with Peter Jackson, the director, send him scripts, so, you know, maybe he'd like to drop a few notes on there. They listened to his notes. He said he didn't receive a single thing. Anyway, so he's been in the press. He's been interviewed about making the original Lord of the Rings films. He said this, he made this interesting observation. He said, 
I, he considered being hypnotized because he wanted the experience of seeing these films he put all of his energies into for what must have been what 12 15 years getting all six of those movies made he put all his energies into it, into every microscopic detail and all the cgi and all the green screen and all that kind of stuff he said he wanted to go he wanted to put himself through hypnosis so that he could watch the films as if he'd never seen them to quote him he said when we did the lord of the rings movies i always felt i was the unluckiest person who never got to see them as a coming out of the blue film it was such a loss for me not to be able to see them like everyone else well he'll be able to have that experience maybe that's partly why amazon didn't send him the scripts maybe they want him to have a, to a totally fresh unfettered experience of the rings of power in terms of films that have been released in the last couple of weeks whilst we've been away, obviously 13 Lives, um, we've done a review of that, the film of the Thai cave rescue story, remarkable story, starring Colin Farrell, Viggo Mortensen, Joel Edgerton, real edge of your seat sort of stuff. It's, it's quite sort of low key, it's not as dramatic as you would expect it to be, but in a sense that almost adds to the kind of horror of what actually happened to those poor kids in the Thai caves. So that's come out, that's available on Amazon Prime, you don't even have to go to the cinema to see that one. Bullet Train is the new action pick starring Brad Pitt and a whole host of other stars. Michael Shannon's in there, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Brian, Ty Brian Tyree Henry, uh, Sandra Bullock is in there with a cameo, uh, Channing Tatum's in there with a, with a cameo too. Um, the review for that's landing on the channel. Action film, a long, big action film set on a bullet train, uh, a bunch of assassins all trying to kill each other. It's got comedy chops, it's by the same director as Deadpool 2. So I think you can be promised some whip smart, silly, sassy, inventive death and fight scenes there. Hit the Road is a curious little kind of indie Indie film, Iranian indie film, which people are describing as Iran's answer to Little Miss Sunshine. The review for that has also landed on the channel. Uh, you can go and check that out. A charming, warm, heartwarming story of a family as they drive, travel across Iran um, as they seek to uh, enable their oldest son essentially to escape Iran and, and, and migrate into Turkey. Um, it's a charming little film, charming observations, charming portrait, if you like, of an ordinary Iranian family trying to, you know, conduct an extraordinary escape plan, if you like. And documentary-wise, Fire of Love, um, a National Geographic documentary. I had the good fortune at the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year to meet the director and the producer. This is the story of two volcanologists who um, were, spent their lives researching volcanoes, filming volcanoes. And this is an entirely archive based uh, documentary portrait of both their relationship, their marriage and their working relationship, uh, but also their romantic relationship and the way in which they committed their lives all the way up to the very end of their lives to the research of volcanoes. It's about sort of passion, it's about compulsion and it's about drive. So those are the films that have been released in the last couple of weeks. And that brings us to the end of this bumper edition of the Weekly Rushes. Your rushed rush through all the movie and streaming news of the last, well, that was of the last two to three, three weeks. So there you go. For more film and family fun don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update